1945. As Allied forces obliterate German cities, Nazi party functionaries scramble for cover, carrying with them far more than their own worldly goods. From D-Day, the 6th of June, to the complete collapse of German military strength, a brief eight months had gone by. There had been little time for the looters to hide their ill-gotten wealth. By war's end, hundreds of millions of dollars in jewels, gold and artworks were being stuffed into strong boxes to be hidden in the most unlikely places. The plunder set off one of the greatest treasure hunts in history. Some of the treasures were buried in an Austrian salt mine during World War II. Some were recovered. Many remain unfound to this day. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. From the east, Russian forces hammer Berlin in the last days of World War II. In the spring of 1945, Adolf Hitler ordered the German army to defend Berlin to the death of the last man. Russian soldiers sealed off Berlin as American troops mopped up the scattered pockets of German resistance east of the Rhine River. In the closing days of the war, every foot of land was paid for with a life. Once haughty German legions defended Hitler's capital city with companies made up of old men and young boys. Russian infantrymen poured into the marble halls of the capital and sounded the death knoll of the so-called Thousand Year Reich. Even as the Allied armies were writing an end to the Third Reich in Berlin, Hitler's henchmen were scurrying to save themselves. Men like Martin Bormann, the architects of Nazi power for a dozen years, weren't about to surrender or commit suicide as their leader had done. They had access to the plunder of Europe, gold bullion worth hundreds of millions of dollars and priceless works of painting and sculpture. They snatched what they could and ran for their lives, some to be caught later, others never to be seen again. Their disappearance touched off the greatest manhunt in history and the greatest search for treasure. As Berlin fell, more than 500 top-ranking Nazis disappeared from sight. They took to the roads, wearing civilian clothes and using any means of transportation they could beg, borrow or steal. The stolen treasures they carried were to be passports to a new life. The departure from Berlin of Nazi leaders was a far cry from their triumphant marches through conquered cities just six years earlier. On a spring day in 1940, the streets of Paris played host to a strange caravan. Riding in an open staff car, selected officers accompanied Adolf Hitler on a tour of the City of Light. 
In less than eight hours, Adolf Hitler would leave Paris, never to return. Himself a frustrated artist, he would order his troops to confiscate the great art treasures of private and public collections and bring them back to the Third Reich. Art historians have often attempted to trace the plundering that occurred during the Nazi occupation of Western Europe. But an impossible jungle of documents has subverted most of their attempts. Like children playing with newfound toys, Hitler and Goring examined each new collection that was brought to Germany. Countless hundreds of millions of dollars in paintings and sculpture adorned the walls of the Nazi Museum in Munich. Still other great treasures were hidden in a 15th century castle called New Schwanstein. The castle was the creation of Ludwig II, the Mad King of Bavaria. In a sense, one madman's monument had become a storehouse for the greed and fantasies of another. For a time, Ludwig's collection of cheap glass and plaster fixtures was dignified by some of the finest works of Europe's old masters. As World War II ended, American GIs were sent to the castle to recover its treasures. What they found were the works of incomparable artists haphazardly grouped with paintings of little or no merit. A salt mine had been the Nazi treasure repository. In the perfectly controlled humidifier, an elaborate vault had been created in which the paintings could be safely housed. To this day, the salt mine remains. It is possible to enter each of the wood-clad rooms and conjure up images of rack upon rack filled with priceless art. The search for treasure taken from the salt mine was assigned to men like Walter Horn, a German-born art historian who worked with U.S. military intelligence after the war. I was assigned to an intelligence unit which was in charge of the recovery of treasures, art treasures that had been displaced or stolen. There were two very interesting cases. One of them was the recovery of the crown jewels of the Holy Roman Empire, five of the most important pieces of which had disappeared. The other one, psychologically perhaps more interesting because the key figure in that story was a woman, was uh, the uh, disappearance of two million dollars worth of gold coins from the salt mines of Altausi. The only thing that was known about them was that they were last in the hands of an SS major called Pum Hummel, who was the right-hand man of Martin Bormann, who was the right-hand man of Adolf Hitler. Right? The problem was to find a man who had disappeared six months earlier. Disappeared from a Berlin under fire. Martin Bormann left the bunker where Hitler was to die and made a frantic race for freedom. Years later, his chauffeur retraced the escape route used by Bormann and his men. 
As Russian tanks bombarded the area around the Reichstag, they made their way across the Spree River. In the very center of the city, they took refuge in an underground train station. In the subway tunnel, wearing civilian clothes, they mingled with frightened Berliners, praying that their meager concrete roof would stand up under the bombardment. Once they reached the western edge of the city, they took temporary refuge in a broken ruin, hoping to last out the day. I went onto the normal, using the normal methods of searching for a man by trying to meet the people who saw him last and see whether his tracks disappeared or did not disappear, they disappeared. Apparently the escapees weathered that night in an abandoned building and the next day set out on a prearranged escape route south. Bormann's face was well known to almost every German. In the chaos surrounding war's end, however, he slipped out of Berlin and made his way to the Alps. After about two weeks in the Austrian mountains, including a search in the Alpine huts and a search in sawmills all the way down from the high Alps to the valley, of Salzburg, I had come to the conclusion that he was lost. Were it not for the dedication of the hunter, the treasure might have been forever lost. That I had no other choice now than to approach Mrs. von Hummel. At the end of a conversation, rather than interrogation of about 45 minutes, she admitted that she knew where he was and declared her willingness to go and see him and to inquire about the whereabouts of the coins. I left her alone for three days, saw her again, and she declared, Lieutenant Horn, I'm happy to report that the coins are in the hands of the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg. I said, this is fine, Mrs. von Hummel, my mission is accomplished. Other pieces of treasure, however, were not found, and years later would become the subject of life and death struggles. Train loads of priceless treasure rolled across the German countryside. Hitler's officers made sure the plunder of Europe was complete. It included the most precious thing of all, humanity. Hundreds of thousands of Jews would be herded aboard Hitler's trains. Many would die of starvation along the way. The trains leaving collection centers throughout Europe were expressions of fundamental Nazi philosophy. To be other than German was to be inferior. To be Jewish was to be despised. At the end of the line were the concentration camps. They were foul stockyards of humanity stripped of hope. With the Jews, Hitler found the scapegoat he needed to explain Germany's failures between the wars. The Nazis were stealing lives now and they weren't above making a profit at it. Grisly crimes were committed by the Nazis in their dozen year reign of terror in Europe. Worst of these were the assaults on human dignity, typified by the robbing of gold from the mouths of murdered Jews. Another atrocity was the collection of huge sums in gold and diamonds from concentration camp inmates who thought they could buy back their lives. They couldn't, but they made their killers rich trying. The horror of it struck home when the Allies took over the camps. They entered as liberators, but there were no cheering crowds. They beheld instead a tragic spectacle. Combat hadn't prepared them for this. The ovens, Hitler's final solution. Human bones piled everywhere. Clearly, the horrors invented by the Nazis were beyond comprehension beyond words. Treasure could be recovered, but lives could not. The task would be enormous. Perhaps it would never be completed. The great bulk of Nazi plunder would be recovered immediately after the war. Uncounted millions, however, disappeared with Hitler's henchmen. Men who, like Martin Bormann, are still at large. Among them, Dr. Joseph Mengele, he conducted unspeakable research on the inmates of concentration camps. 
Inmates would have sooner faced the ovens than Mengele's knife. At Nuremberg, the Allies tried top Nazi leaders captured at war's end. But the colonels and majors of the Third Reich carried their treasures with them into peacetime Europe. Austria's Lake Toplitze, gold bars and hundreds of thousands of counterfeit English pounds were recovered from the lake in 1957. What better place for hiding treasure quickly than a deep alpine lake? How much remains to be discovered? Two men have disappeared trying to answer that question. The search goes on in spite of the lake's ominous history. The Austrian government tries to discourage treasure hunters, but the lure of Nazi gold is powerful. Two volunteer firemen from a nearby city have dreamed of the riches that may lie beneath the lake. The dream brings them to Toplitze again and again. Perhaps this will be the day. The quest is exhilarating, but not without danger. Vigilance is important. Yeah. Treasure hunters are optimists, and it is a fine day for a dive. Optimists, yes. But the treasure hunters know other hunters may be abroad. The men who hid the gold were not strangers to killing. Who knows where they are now? The water is deep and cold. It is easy to see how it has kept its secret for more than 30 years. The divers are spurred by the knowledge that the quest paid off once. There was another time when blood may have been spilled to keep the secret of the lake. The secret was born in 1945. The Nazi hierarchy, not killed outright, was in flight. If they were caught, they might lie their way out of long prison sentences, but not if they were caught with treasure. Fortunes must have been hidden in haste. Lakes along the escape route beckoned. Almost 20 years later, some of the treasure has already been found. Perhaps someone was there to make sure no more would be. Did the divers find something? Something that cost them their lives? We only know that they vanished. Some think the underground Nazi movement called Odessa was involved. It is 1976. No one will vanish on this dive. There will be no treasure either. It is possible that the gold remaining in Toplitze was moved years ago when its guardians felt others closing in. There are many other lakes and many secret bank accounts. Serious investigators don't dismiss the notion that there are still men in hiding who would see Hitler's nightmare world reborn. Great treasure would have to be close at hand to once again unleash the dogs of war. That prospect alone may be enough to drive men to continue the search for Nazi plunder. Renaissance culture is the center for the continuing search for the plundered art treasures of Europe. Rudolfo Siviero is the most active of the art detectives. 
He stayed on the trail of Nazi art thieves long after others had given up. Sabiero has searched thousands of German documents for clues. With them, he has recovered dozens of stolen masterpieces. Manifests, bills of lading, army memos, reminders of past outrages. The collections of the Uffizi Gallery and the Pitti Palace in Florence have been reconstructed through the work of Severo and his colleagues. Yet Severo estimates that a third of Italy's plundered art is still missing. He thinks much of it is hidden behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany. One of his hardest tasks has been to root out the fake masterpieces that began showing up after the war. Museums, anxious to restore their collections, often fell victim to swindles. The flood of copies has made it even harder to trace the fate of the originals. Siviero remains dedicated to restoring his nation's art heritage, no matter how difficult the task. It is important for men like Severo to believe that beauty can endure. It must endure if man is to banish the ugliness of war. Perhaps if beauty endures, the flaming destruction of the past can finally be cast aside. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians.